Hello and welcome back to section 2.3, part 2. Today we're going to look at the second part of part 3, which deals with derivatives of trigonometric functions and higher order derivatives. Now the key thing that you need to write down right here is this, these derivatives, okay? Now you know the derivative of sine and cosine already. You are required to know all six derivatives for the AP test. So you will not be given this table on a test or quiz. So please start to look at these now. So example eight deals with finding the derivative of x minus tan x. We know the derivative of x, oops, this is really y prime. So the derivative of y prime is going to give us the one, and then the derivative of tangent is going to be secant squared. So I'm going to go 1 minus secant squared x. And this right here is our derivative. Now for part 2, we have a product rule. And our product is x times secant x. So we do have to apply that. So if I take the first, which is x, times the derivative of the second, the derivative of secant is secant x tan x, then I'm going to add that to the second, which is secant x, times the derivative of the first, or 1. And what I get from that is x secant x tan x plus secant x. And if you really wanted to, you could go ahead and factor out the secant x, since that's a common factor in both terms, and that would give you x times tangent of x plus 1 inside of the parentheses. Now, we, I know we've kind of had this conversation in class, but a lot of times um, you, can, you can take a derivative, but it requires a lot of simplifying after you do the differentiation. So this is kind of a table, and it's not anything you have to write down, but it just wanted to show you like, this right here is what you get for a derivative. This is what it will simplify to. This right here is maybe what you got for example 3 as a, as a derivative initially. This is what we simplify it to. So you can see that this side here is a lot more complex than this. But the thing I really want you to remember is on that AP test, you do not want to make an error. If you have this, you're okay. If you make a mistake trying to come up with this, you just lost your points. So please be careful when you're simplifying. The last thing we're going to look at in this section is called higher order derivatives. And what you do with a higher order derivative is you're really taking a derivative of a derivative. And you might do this two or three or four times or however many times. Now a classic example of a higher order derivative is when you're trying to find acceleration. So in the previous section, we look, or earlier on, we looked at the derivative of a position function was velocity. So now if we take the derivative of velocity, we'll actually find acceleration. Okay, or if we're given our position function, which is usually denoted by the s of t function, if we take that derivative twice, we'll get our acceleration. This is a really key concept to know for Algebra 1 and for that, or I'm sorry, Calculus 1 and for that AP test. Now, the notation for a second derivative, and let's kind of omit that, that didn't come through, but a second derivative is usually represented by like a little double prime. So in this case, you'd have S double prime of T, and this is considered a higher order. If you want a third derivative, you'll go S and then do a little triple prime, of t, and we'll see a table here in just a second. Here's that table. This is just kind of some multiple higher order derivatives right here, and these are all of the different notations that you may encounter along the way. And all they mean is just to keep taking the derivative of the previous derivative. So our last example says, because the moon has no atmosphere, a falling object on the moon encounters no air resistance. In 1971, an astronaut demonstrated that a feather and a hammer fell at the same rate as the moon. The position function for each of these falling objects is given by this function, and that should be t squared, where s of t is the height in meters and t is the time. What is the ratio of Earth's gravitational force to the moon's? 
And if you remember, a gravitational force, this is really your acceleration. So to find acceleration, I'm going to have to take the second derivative of the displacement function. So the derivative of s of t is going to give me velocity, which is really equal to, and this, I apologize, that should be a t squared. I have negative 0.81 times 2, which is going to give me a negative 1.62 t. And now to find the acceleration, I'm going to take the second derivative of displacement, which is really the first derivative of velocity, or the velocity of this, or I'm sorry, the derivative of this equation. And when I do that, I'm left with a negative 1.62 as a derivative. Okay, and my units are meters per second squared. So now that we know that the moon's gravitational force is a negative 1.62, and I know that the Earth's gravitational point, let's see, Earth will write over here, a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So because it wants the ratio of the Earth's gravitational force to the moon's, we're going to take that negative 9.8 and divide it by the negative 1.62 that we just calculated. And you'll see that our ratio is approximately equal to 6.0. Now this does conclude the last example. And now for today's fun fact. And today's fun fact it's something that I happen to find kind of funny every time I read it. Hopefully you guys have a good night, and we will see you in class tomorrow.